Well, hello and welcome to this very, very special edition of Talk Time. This week, we're going to be having a very, very special conversation. And this conversation would be about every and anything Iran. We're also going to be looking at the world. We're going to be looking at the Middle East. We're going to be looking at sanctions and its impact. We're going to be looking at everything. Welcome to Talk Time. Well, hello and welcome to this very special edition of Talk Time. And as I indicated before, this is special. It is special because we're going to be talking about a special people and we're going to be talking about a special country. We're going to be talking about the Islamic Republic of Iran. We're going to be talking about its relations with Ghana and Africa. And then we'll look at all the imposition of sanctions. We're going to look at the JCOP. And then we'll look at the situation in the Middle East and, and, and the Iran factor in the Middle East. We'll probably be looking at Yemen, Syria, you know, especially Palestine, and many, many other issues. It is indeed my very distinguished pleasure to welcome to this conversation Dr. Saeed. Khalid Zada, who is the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran and also the spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic. Your Excellency, you're welcome. Thank you. Good to be with you. Your Excellency, what brings you to Ghana at this time? Uh, traditionally speaking, Ghana has a very special uh, stance in Iran's foreign policy. Uh, going back to 30 years ago, Iran started sort of uh, a strategic uh, uh, look at uh, uh, countries such as Ghana in West, knowing that we have to balance our foreign policy and reach out to the people and the countries of this region and Ghana among all, all, all the countries in the West uh, definitely ha had and still has a very special stance in Iran's foreign policy. Uh, from then, we started to establish uh, institutions here to help the people of Ghana. Uh, we started to establish <coughs> a very unique clinic that uh, today everybody knows it in Accra, Iran Clinic. Uh, which, which, which mounted to be one of the best example of how a country can uh, provide uh, basic needs for a local society and integrating into a society. Now, Iran Clinic is, 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 a, uh, is, is part of the community in Accra. M more than that, we try to help the education of the young and uh, uh, intelligent, clever, gifted students in Accra um, we established the university, Islamic University at that time was the only, the first and the only Islamic university running by uh, 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 the professors from your country and still is one of the best examples of how education can bring uh, nations closer together. Well, more than that, we try to help developing the rural areas of different parts of Ghana. We uh, opened uh, um, offices uh, across the country helping the rural area of, uh, of, of, of Ghana to be developed and still we have a lot of joint uh, endeavors of how we can uh, develop local uh, regions. Uh, for Iran, Ghana is a gateway to Africa and our relations has been boosted and we are trying to enhance our relations and, well, uh, and upgrade it and promote it. Uh, for that promotion, we need, to, uh, we, we need to start new projects and new uh, proposals uh, going beyond just economic and trade and business relations. So people to people uh, relations, cultural cooperation, uh, trying to exchange different uh, uh, delegations, uh, having cultural weeks in, uh, the, uh, in our respected capitals and so on and so forth. These are all the reasons that we have to make sure that we are on the right track and I am here to, to focus more and to show that the new administration of Iran has this uh, uh, program and has this agenda to bring back 
Africa to the center of its uh, look east policy and balancing Iran's foreign policy. It appears that in Ghana, change of governments have not affected relations with Iran. How do you manage it? I mean, we're very strong in Ghana from the Kufour time to the Rawlings time to the Mills time, even now. How do you manage it? <clears throat> uh, for us, uh, Ghana as a country and as a nation is the most important thing. Uh, the political structure of Ghana is respected. Uh, whoever is running your country is respected. So we are trying to reach out to the people and heart of people and we are trying to accommodate mm -hmm. their requests. So we are at the disposal of the people of, of Ghana and Ghana as a country, uh, as a sovereign country. This is the magic rule that we are following to make <coughs> friendship. And friendship meaning to remain with your friend uh, regardless of what's happening in that country. Does your visit to Ghana at this time has anything to do with the Vienna talks? I refer to the JCPOA. Uh, we have followed two uh, different ways, two parallel ways. Uh, in the past uh, few years, especially after the new administration came to office in Iran. One is to uh, neutralize what we call it uh, illegal, unilateral, uh, extraterritorial sanctions imposed by the United States. And one is to removing uh, sanctions. Uh, for, for neutralizing uh, sanctions, we have decided to make resilient partnership with our friends across the world. For removing sanctions, we have decided to go to Vienna as the previous administration started uh, uh, with uh, President Biden administration's team in Vienna. Still, it's going on, so we are, we are actually parallelly follow both uh, in, in Vienna in different capitals. The, the international media suggests that we are very close to an agreement. Is that true? Very close and very far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we are very close if the United States make the necessi necessary political uh, decision uh, 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 and we can go to Vienna. We are far if the United States decides not to make the uh, political decision needed for, uh, for, for concluding the, uh, to, con to concluding Vienna talks. Let me elaborate a little bit more on this. We have started negotiations uh, almost 11 months ago. Uh, based on this request of United States that President Biden administration would like to get back to the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or as known, uh, the Iran's nuclear deal. Uh, the record of United States was not so clear and uh, was not so promising because we negotiated very hard uh, from 2013 to 2015. We signed and sealed and put uh, the deal on the shelf and with this promise that we are going to honor our words and we are going to be uh, committed to the merit and to the words of the deal. Unfortunately, uh, United States decided not to be uh, loyal to what uh, we negotiated very hard. Trump administration uh, illegally withdrew from the JCPOA while Washington knew that the uh, nuclear talk was something, endorsed, uh, was something that was endorsed by the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2231. And uh, in parentheses, uh, it is a still a legal binding um, agreement because it was endorsed uh, by that resolution. Anyway, Trump, as a rogue regime in Washington, decided to withdraw from the JCPOA and imposed, uh, they called it maximum pressure campaign on Iran, hoping that they are going to make the people of Iran, the, the proud uh, and great people of Iran, to revolt against their political structure, uh, which, which resulted in uh, a maximum failure for, for Washington. As the new administration in the White House mentioned, it was not successful at all. The maximum resistance of the of Iranians uh, uh, was successful. 
So when they came to office, they decided to get back to the deal. What we said that we cannot let you in uh, unless you show to us that you have the will, you have the capability and capacity that this time you are going to deliver what you are going to be committed to. So the negotiation started with the aim that United States uh, uh, give us objective guarantees that, uh, that Washington is not going to mock the international law, international relations again. They are not going to violate the deal again. They are not going to misuse uh, uh, the embedded sentences or mechanisms uh, in the JCPOA to, uh, to sabotage the whole deal as Trump did. So there was uh, a real logic behind these negotiations that we wanted to make sure that United you know, States this time is not, going, is not going to punish all those companies and all those countries that they want to have legitimate uh, business with Iran. For Iran, JCPOA, the nuclear deal, meant sanction relief. For Washington and for, for Europeans, maybe it was a more of a nuclear deal. But for Iran, it was sanction relief. And unfortunately, Washington showed to everybody it, that it is not trustworthy. So the whole negotiations in Vienna was to make sure that this time Washington is genuinely and you know, honestly is going to get back to the deal to help that we address and, uh, such, a, such an artificial manufactured crisis over Iran's peaceful nuclear activities. Still, we are not there. Still, Washington has not shown to everybody that uh, unfortunately, Biden administration is putting a lot of energy and time to protect the legacy of Trump, not to actually uh, make a new legacy that, they, uh, that, the, that the international community deserves to have. Just wondering, I mean, why Iran would trust the United States of America at this stage, given the fact that Biden can lose elections. Trump can come back to power. What is the guarantee that if they reach an agreement this time, they will stick to the agreement? This is a very bitter reality that you are uh, putting forward, that why changing administrations in one capital should just change uh, uh, a signed and sealed agreement? What is the basic, uh, uh, what, what, is, what is the basis for such a, for such an action by Washington. It seems that uh, Washington believes that it has an exceptional position in international law, international relations, that they can violate whatever they would like. And it is not true. Uh, if even a new administration comes to office in Washington, they are not some sort of rebellious uh, government. They are government of the United States. They have to be abided by the signature of the previous administration. States. Uh, actually speaks international relations, not governments. And this is something that this is the basic for, for, for the students of international law. But, but you are right. Uh, they have shown to everybody that if there is a change in White House, there should be, there might be change in, in, in even fundamental um, areas. This is exactly why we think that we have to, and it is in the benefit of everybody, including Europeans and all uh, countries, that we have to make sure that if it is not impossible, but it is very much costly and it is very much difficult for anybody to violate again this deal. Uh, maybe they violate again. They have shown in the past that they are not trustworthy. Maybe in the future they approve that they are not trustworthy again. But what we have to do and we ha what we have uh, uh, absolute responsibility about is to make sure that we do have enough, enough legal, political, and economic objective guarantees uh, uh, to sign this deal. Now, some of the enemies of the Islamic Republic have claimed that the, the Republic is determined to produce a nuclear weapon. Is it true? If you mean by enemies Israel, Israel... Israel, the, the Trump administration, and so on. Uh, the Trump administration, without any evidence, uh, said that, but even the intelligence services of different countries, including United States, said that Iran 
had no intention and has no intention to do so. The only, uh, the only entity that it is claiming so is the Israeli regime, which possesses hundreds of nuclear warheads, and do not forget that this regime is not member to any international or uh, international agreements about non-proliferation. You know, uh, the United States is supporting Israel. They are, uh, they are closing their eyes to this regime, this, this, this aggressive regime, while this aggressive, aggressive regime has not uh, abided it, itself to the non-proliferation treaties and poses hundreds of nuclear warheads. The United States has imposed extensive sanctions on the Iranian National Army, the Revolutionary Guards. Could that become an impediment in the way of arriving at a settlement? What is the most important thing and what is very significant is that the sanctions in the first, all the sanctions in the first place are illegal, are unlawful, are uh, against international law unilateral, extraterritorial. Uh, this is the basic question, who gives right to the United States to sanction other, uh, other countries and other people and target ordinary people and do not forget when we say sanctions is not just a word. It's, it is a war, it is economic terrorism against the ordinary people because the most vulnerable, uh, the most uh, weakest are those who first will be targeted by these, these sort of sanctions. Of course, as the government of Iran, as the Islamic Republic of Iran, we had and we do have uh, the full responsibility to protect our people uh, uh, being, being, being our soldiers or being our ordinary people. So regardless of what the United States is doing, we have been able, thanks God, to protect our, uh, our people and to enhance uh, the, 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 their position and their situation. But if you mean by this that United States decided to put uh, Iran's army, parts of Iran's army uh, uh, in, in the sanctions, it is not the first time that United States has done this. We, we are getting used to this sort of sanctions and uh, sanctions now are losing their credibility because United States is addicted to sanctions. Mm -hmm. And those who are addicted to something, they cannot see actually the uh, the benefit of that. They do that because they are addicted. So, yes, we are, we are protecting our uh, entities, we are protecting our people. We do not let anybody to put uh, fake labels on our uh, legitimate, uh, legitimate institutions, including our armies. We very much uh, resist about, uh, against all these sort of activities and all these sort of efforts by Washington. We put CENTCOM in our terrorist uh, list as well uh, and, and we have done tit for tat uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of activities but 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 the most important thing is that we have to make sure that you know the state is not playing with us is not playing with this deal is not playing with the international community by such arguments by Washington trying to protect or trying to keep some aspects of Trump's legacy, some parts of Trump's legacy, uh, we are making more sure that even President Biden is not very much determined to remove sanctions, but they are playing with time and our energy. One of the issues which has been introduced into recent talks is the production of, of missiles, ballistic missiles. What is your reaction to the coupling of the production of ballistic missiles into the nuclear talks? We have, we, we have never let anybody to talk about our defense means. This is something out of compromise. No country on earth, no rational country on earth compromise on its national security. Uh, there is no difference between Washington and Tehran. Uh, our missiles are open our uh, uh, means of defense and we are not to negotiate about you know our, our defense do not forget that all iran's nuclear activities have been time and again approved by iaea international atomic energy agency the watchdog that has the mandate to supervise uh, all the activities in different countries regarding uh, nuclear activities i mean uh, more than 15 times 
has approved that Iran fully and faithfully has implemented the JCPOA. Iran has uh, been part of the NPT from a long time ago. And do not forget, we are talking about the JCPOA, Iran's nuclear deal, and Iran reducing its commitment under this agreement. But Iran has never withdrawn from non-proliferation treaty. So we are member to the non-proliferation treaty. We do respect safeguards. IAEA is in Iran. They are super supervising our activities. They are monitoring our activities based on the safeguard uh, rules and regulations. What Iran has reduced its, its commitment under the nuclear deal, which is an unprecedented uh, uh, agreement regarding non proliferation. Uh, Iran decided uh, 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 in, in a short period of time to have enhanced mechanism of supervision uh, over its nuclear activities in return of sanction relief and also IAEA being able to make sure that all Iran's nuclear activities are peaceful. We were in the middle of that way that Trump decided to withdraw from the JCPOA. So getting back to the missile, we are not uh, compromising on our national uh, security, our, our, our missiles are for, the, for our defense, while we do have just peaceful nuclear activities. And by the way, our ballistic missiles uh, fits uh, our needs. We do not have intercontinental ballistic missiles. Mm. We do have ballistic missiles based on <coughs> our uh, uh, programs and needs. We do have uh, programs that are very clear and, uh, and I can say crystal clear to everybody and we have announced it publicly. Will the imposition of, of draconian sanctions on, on Russia impact in any way the outcome of the Vienna negotiations? Uh, we are living in a world that uh, everything is related to each uh, to, to another. Uh, but we have also a principle uh, in diplomatic practice, compartmentalization. We are trying to, uh, we are trying to uh, follow every each file and dossier based on the merit of that file and, and that dossier. There are different issues that we do differ with, with even the negotiating parties in the, uh, in the JCPOA, Iran and European, three European countries, Iran um, and, and, and European Union, we do have different approaches uh, uh, about different issues. But we decided to negotiate and we decided to closely cooperate on one issue, which is sanction relief and also nuclear activities of Iran. So everybody is committed to work with each other on this very file, while probably and clearly there are differences over other hot topics and hot issues. Well, we are going to take a short break now. And uh, when we do come back, we'll be talking about many other things, including the current situation in Syria and the role that the Islamic Republic of Iran has played in stabilizing Syria. Short break. Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And uh, we are privileged to have with us His Excellency Dr. Saeed Khalib uh, Zada, who is the Deputy Minister, Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and also happens to be the spokesperson of the ministry. And we are talking about everything. Now, Your Excellency, what is Iran's position on Syria? Uh, Syria should be respected in terms of uh, their endeavor to protect their sovereignty and you know, the, uh, their, uh, uh, their territorial integrity. There were those countries that started uh, their uh, operation in Syria with this uh, misleading motto that Assad must go. Yeah. And we, we do not forget the time that with this misleading um, uh, motto which resulted in a wrong narrative, they, uh, they supported thousands of extremists and terrorists inside Syria and they made a lot of uh, uh, difficulties and human tragedy inside the country. Uh, the great people of Syria uh, decided to uh, defeat and to decided to resist 
uh, against those who invaded, those who manipulated, those who tried to sabotage uh, the country. It was very harmful. It was uh, very hard. It was very heartbreaking moments uh, in, in Syria. But, but they could manage to win the war. Now we have to help them to win the peace. It means that we have to make sure that uh, they can negotiate, they can reach out to real people who are uh, real Syrians and they would like to rebuild their uh, society. Iran has been always clear from the beginning that uh, while we are supporting the territorial integrity and sovereignty of uh, Syria, while we are supporting the, the people of Syria and we are trying to uh, prevent them to be targeted by terrorist groups and terrorist organizations, unfortunately funded by some regional and extra-regional players, we decided also to help them to rebuild their society and still we are doing the same. We cannot talk, be talking about Syria without talking about the spread or the Takfiri groups, not just in Syria, in Iraq, you know, now even in Africa and so on. What is the official attitude of the Islamic Republic to these Takfiri groups and, and, and the way they are spreading throughout the world? The world is so tired. The world is tired of these extremists and these extremist groups, these Takfiri groups that are spreading all over the world, not only in Syria and in, um, in Iraq, the whole Levant, but also in, in Africa, also now they are transferring to, to some parts of Afghanistan and we are very much concerned about the future of our region and also the future of some parts of, of, of Africa. Uh, we have to address collectively this extremism. We have to join together to address the root cause of that, which is this ideology, this uh, takfiri ideology, which, is, which comes from a wrong narrative of, uh, of, of, uh, of Islam and if I can say unfortunately politically motivated by those who are trying to misuse even in the West to misuse these groups for their political agenda. Um, if you go deep into that uh, groups you see that they do not have any religion, they do not have any ideology, they are not affiliated to any religion. They do not have any denomination. The only things that they believe is this uh, uh, extremist ideology that they follow to gain the power, to manipulate, to, uh, to dominate people. And these are the things that we all have to all get together and all combat. What is the difference? Is there any difference between Iran's involvement in Iraq and Iran's involvement in Syria. Of course, taking note of the fact that Iraq actually under Saddam Hussein waged war against the Islamic Republic. This is exactly why we look at Iraq as a very special country. The only regime there to attack Iran was Saddam Hussein. And we of course separated this regime from the great people of Iraq uh, and soon we sheltered a lot of Iraqi who escaped from Saddam Hussein tyranny. We, we sheltered them in Iran and they left uh, and, and, and they lived with us. Uh, let me tell you this, Iran and Iraq have all the reasons why they have to be close and why they have to have very extraordinary relations. Uh, not, only, um, uh, not only cultural, civilizational, people to people, and um, um, religious reasons, but also geographically speaking, geostrategically speaking, geoeconomically speaking, the, the proximity of two countries in, the, um, in West Asia all necessitates that we have very good relations. Um, let me just tell you about one important example. Um, you know Arbain is something that we commemorate 40 days after the death of uh, the martyrdom of the Imam Hussein. There is a march uh, that, uh, that people march uh, towards the shrine of uh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. In that Arba'in uh, 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 rally, more than 40 million Irani 
Iranians and Iraqis and other Shiite groups and Shiite people gather together and marching in Iraq. It shows to what extent we are interwoven with each, with each other and there, there are, there are multi-layer uh, relations between two countries. So uh, why we do have normal relations, why we do have close relations, why we do have very extraordinary relations because everything necessitates that. It is not something that even governments uh, alone are building. This is something that the, so the society and the people are, are interacting with each other and it goes back, dates back to the history. Uh, those who sheltered in Iran and a lot of Iranian uh, who sheltered in, uh, in, 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 in Iraq or, uh, or, or for, for many personal or religious reasons lived there. Uh, with Syria, again, we are and we do have very special relations. Do not forget that when Saddam Hussein attacked Iran, uh, then Hafez Assad, the president of Syria, was among uh, few Arab countries who supported Iran and who said that Saddam Hussein is uh, is 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 is, is uh, aggressor and uh, uh, try to be standing on the right side of the history. We never forget our friends, and this is the nature of Iran's foreign policy. Uh, from then, Iran and Syria made a very friendly, brotherly relations, and it continues up until now. In spite of Aberdeen in spite of the cultural relations, in spite of the historical ties and so on, it is clear that there are some forces trying to promote division in Iraq, especially on religious ground, mobilizing everybody against Shia Muslims and so on. What's your attitude to this attempt to divide the Iraqi society on the basis of religious sect? Uh, unfortunately, there are those who are not happy to see uh, Iraq united, to see Iraq to getting back to the leadership of Arab countries, to see Iraq having a, a special regional role, to see Iran, uh, Iraq uh, having uh, uh, or being able to develop its country uh, 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 rapidly. As Iran, we have done all we could and all we can to help the Iraqi government, the Iraqi people to develop their own country to get back to the Arab scene uh, hel ha has helped them to play a um, uh, constructive role in, in our region. As Iran, we do have uh, relations with all parties in Iraq, uh, being Sunnis, being Kurds, being um, uh, Arabs, Shiites. So we do have, uh, we do have friends uh, in Iraq, so we are trying to, to use uh, these uh, this relations to help them to have more stable Iraq. The Iranian national hero, General Suleiman, was assassinated in Iraq. What do you think has been the consequences of that assassination? That assassination changed the destiny of our region. Trump administration uh, did a very ugly crime. Uh, Trump administration covertly assassinated Iran's top general, the peacemaking general of Iran, uh, who was the hero against Daesh, who was the hero of defeating ISIS in the Levant. And Trump administration uh, uh, hugely served this ISIS and Daesh and these extremists by this covertly assassination. Iran decided to show to the United States that the time of hit and run has passed as um, our leader uh, very clearly once said. So we decided in response to this covertly assassination, we hit back United States, United States base, and we took all the responsibility and showed to, and told to everybody that this is something that we are just as, 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 just, just, just as a uh, manifestation of Iran's uh, readiness to uh, hit back. But we do not uh, stop our endeavor until we bring all those who made uh, this uh, crime to the justice. And this is our absolute decisions and we are uh, following this and following this line. 
Now, recently, the Iranian security launched an attack on an Israeli spy base in Ibil in Iraq. Is there any connection between the operations against General Suleiman and, and, and what the enemies of, of Iran are doing in Iraq with this attack on the Israeli spy station in Ibil? Uh, once I said uh, in this very interview that Iran and no air, uh, country on earth would compromise on its national security. Uh, this is another example that uh, uh, how Iran reacts. We time and again repeatedly inform the central government of Iran, I Iraq, uh, in public, in private, in different conversation, in the conversation at different levels. Uh, we convey this that we do not tolerate that Iraq soil being misused by the Israeli regime to sabotage uh, against Iran. Uh, we also told to the, uh, to the authorities of Erlim, the, the Kurdistan region, about this. Unfortunately, that center was one of the center that uh, Israeli has, uh, has built actually to sabotage uh, uh, issues and uh, sabotage affairs inside Iran, we decided to hit and we decided to show to everybody that our pinpointing missiles can ruin it. We have all the intelligence, we do have, uh, we do have all the data. The time, when the time is arrived, we are uh, definitely react and we did it. Uh, the, the message was clear, uh, I think, well transferred. Well, viewers, we are in a conversation with His Excellency Dr. Saeed Khalib Zada, who is the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran and who is also the spokesperson of the ministry. We're going to take another short break. And when we come back, we like to look at the situation in Palestine. What does Palestine mean, not just for the Iranian people and the Palestinian people, but for the world? Short break. Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated from the very beginning, this is a very special interview. And there's an interview with His Excellency, Saeed Khalib. Zada, who is the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran and spokesperson of the ministry, and we are talking about everything. Now, sir, what is your assessment of the situation in Palestine? Uh, the root cause of uh, many problems in our region is the occupation of Palestine by the Israeli regime. Decades of unsettled dispute uh, in Palestine has caused a lot of accumulated uh, problems. These unsettled accumulated problems in the occupied territory has caused a lot of difficulties. Israeli regime has waged different wars against its neighbors and still is trying to terrorize the whole region because, because this regime has shown to everybody that in peace it cannot survive. So, the, uh, so what is happening right now is this uh, uh, is this uh, regime trying to run an open air uh, prison in, in, in Palestine, as the West Bank people calls or uh, calls uh, their territory the largest open air prison in the world? Unfortunately, the apartheid regime of Israel is trying to discriminate against you know the people of Palestine, and we think that unless we solve the problem, unless we make a real uh, referendum uh, in occupied Palestine and all the inhabitants, indigenous inhabitants of Palestine comes to the ballot box and decides about their future. Uh, we cannot see peace in the whole region. Do you still support the two-state solution? We support referendum. We think that uh, we have to let the people to democratically talk about the future of uh, Holy Land and Palestine and, uh, and Masjid al-Aqsa, we think that the, 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 
the state of Palestine with the capital of Masjid al-Aqsa should be established as the uh, only way going out of this crisis, this decades-long crisis in our region. The Trump administration decided to give Jerusalem al-Quds to Israel as a gift. Trump decided many things as a rogue regime in Washington. Uh, nobody on earth can, uh, has any right to give uh, Masjid al-Aqsa uh, to uh, the Israeli regime. Uh, the solution to this problem is a referendum, uh, a democratic solution that Iran has proposed. What do you think about the so-called normalization of relations with some Arab countries? Israel and some Arab countries. Uh, what, what, what we saw was uh, uh, Trump uh, plus uh, Bibi Netanyahu who plot to uh, penetrate into the uh, Arab countries and Islamic countries to, to select a uh, few Western oriented uh, governments in Arab worlds to trying to penetrate them and to divide the whole Af Arab and Islamic countries. Two weeks ago, I was representing the Islamic Republic of Iran in the OIC meeting in Islamabad. There, almost 99% of the countries participated said that the, the, the only and real cause for the OIC was and still is Palestine and the Palestinian cause cannot be neglected by anybody, including those who betrayed this cause and soon they will know that uh, they betrayed themselves and this circus and this show would not help them to, to uh, buy security as the, the Israeli regime is in the lowest possible level of legitimacy in the occupied Palestine they do, they do have and they do face a lot of problems and, uh, and those who are trying to buy security from this regime are actually uh, uh, taking a very uh, uh, misleading way, I, say, I can say. They have misunderstanding about what's going on in the region, the, a misunderstanding that has resulted to a misperception, a misperception that has resulted to this management and this, a mismanagement and miscalculation that will be danger, a danger for our region and for themselves. Well, only last week, Anthony Blinken, met with five Arab foreign ministers in Israel. And Anthony Blinken actually said that that meeting is meant to intimidate the Islamic Republic of Iran. Are you intimidated? What do you think? <laughs> uh, uh, the previous administ administration in Washington uh, put much more efforts uh, to do so. You remember John Bolton, the uh, uh, National, Security Secre National Security Advisor to the President, the mm -hmm. former President, mm -hmm. once said that next year, next February, at that time 2000, probably 16 or 17, we will be in Tehran. All, they have all gone to the ashes of history and Iran stands tall. Iran is millennia country, a very old civilization. We have been there and we will be there. We are not manufactured artificial identity or country. We have been always there. You know, the state is not welcome to that region as Israeli artificially made, uh, made entity is not as never will be welcome in our region. Palestinians are subject to this tragedy and we have to help them. We have, uh, we have aggressors and those who have been aggressed. We have oppress oppressors and those who have been oppressed. We have right and wrong. We, we, we do have victims and those who are killing them. So this is a real simple question. Whether we are going to stand with those who are victim or, those, or we are going to stand with the aggressors and those who are killing uh, people, definitely we cannot uh, get along or we cannot bandwagon with this cruelty that we are seeing from Israeli regime and also the supporters of this regime, which on the top of the list is Washington. The Palestinians are suffering a great deal 
frequent bombardments. Mm -hmm. Their farms are being destroyed. Their orchards are being destroyed. Educational institutions are being destroyed. Whether they live in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank, they are in virtual prisons beyond the declaration of support for the Palestinian people. What should countries like Iran, which are opposed to apartheid, which are opposed to racism, do for the Palestinian people? After the Islamic Revolution, Iran decided to cut its relation with the only apartheid regime of that time was the South Africa. We still consistently follow the same policy. We have to uh, uh, we raise awareness around the globe. We have to try to unite people against apartheid, about, against racism. The, uh, the, the only example in today's world of this racism and apartheid is the Israeli regime. Uh, we, we always have supported the cause and we will support the cause until uh, a democratically solution being adopted in the occupied Palestine. Do you support renewed talks between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Peace talks, like the Oslo, Oslo peace talks. We support the will of Palestinian people. You are not opposed to another Oslo talks? We support, we oppose any, we oppose any circus, we oppose any show, we oppose any manipulation, only our, all, uh, all the artificial uh, uh, gatherings that are aimed to legitimize the occupation and occupier. What we support is the will of the Palestinian people, uh, establishment of the country of Palestine with the capital of Otsu Sharif. Well, we are going to take another short break, and uh, when we come back, we shall continue this very, very special conversation with the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And when we come back, we would like to take a trip to Lebanon. A trip to Lebanon. Short break. Hello and welcome to this very special conversation on Talk Time with Dr. Saeed Khalid Zada who is the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran and also the spokesperson of the ministry. Lebanon is another troubled spot. The economy is in trouble. There is some mass hysteria generated by the West and reactionary forces against Hezbollah, which has very good relations with Iran. What is your assessment of the situation in Lebanon? Hezbollah is part of uh, the government in Lebanon. It, it's, very, it's a very bitter reality that uh, uh, some Western countries, when they do not like some aspects of politics in the Middle East, they are trying to label those parts and they, they're trying to delegitimize uh, those groups or those parts of societies. Hezbollah has MPs in parliament. Hezbollah is, is a Lebanese group. And as a Lebanese group has all the rights to be part of the politics inside uh, Lebanon. What has been their reaction? Sanction them. They are addicted to sanctions. They are addicted to this hegemonic behavior, this colonial behavior that they think that they can dictate everything to all the nations. And time has changed. There is awareness inside different countries. Hezbollah is our friends. We are not shy to, to tell that. We are proud that we have such capable friends uh, around the Middle East. Uh, and friends meaning that we do respect each other, but we do not intervene in the in internal affairs of each other. Hezbollah and other groups in Lebanon have all the rights to talk to each other, to cooperate with each other, to trying to run the, the country. Unfortunately, those who are trying to sanction the country or taking hostage the economy as a bargain chip to, to advance their political agenda are responsible for the situation right now in Lebanon. As the Somali Republic of Iran, we have always tried to facilitate and try to help uh, the situation to be, much, uh, to be eased in, 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 in Lebanon and we continue to do so. 
Lebanon is in crisis, no doubt. And one of the features of the crisis, the Lebanese crisis, is shortage of fuel. What can you do or what have you done for the Lebanese people? We have publicly said that we are ready to help them. We have, we have publicly said that we are ready to send uh, fuel if they ask uh, for and, 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 and on record uh, we are ready to ease their uh, situation. There are private sectors capable, rich in Lebanon, that they can buy oil and fuel from Iran, and we are ready to provide them. But the sanctions would not allow you to, to do it to the maximum. What kind of sanctions? We are talking about the sanctions imposed unilaterally by the exactly. United States, not mandated by United Nations. Washington has no right to put sanctions because they do not like Iranian, Iran and the Iranian political system or they do not like parts of Iran, uh, Lebanese uh, government or Lebanese society. They are, this is cruel. This is, this is wrong. And, and, and we have decided to have resilient partnership with our friends to trying to free our relations from the third party effect. And we have been able to manage that. No doubt that the uh, United States and its uh, peripheries and its clients have tried to manipulate, have tried to sabotage, have tried to, to, uh, to actually meddle in this way, but we have been always uh, innovative in terms of helping our friends, in terms of telling to everybody that nobody should be abided by these illegal, unlawful sanctions uh, imposed by, the, by Washington against all the international law and norms. How do you see the future of Lebanon? Very bright. Very bright. Uh, Lebanese people are very well educated, are very intelligent. They have all the uh, uh, reasons to be, uh, to be at the top of the mountain. Uh, we, I have been in, in Lebanon. I have talked to different Lebanese authorities. I have interacted with different uh, Lebanese factions. They are capable, they are around the world, they are good businessmen, they are good uh, academicians. So they have all the basics. Uh, b basics. Uh, Americans and Europeans, unfortunately, and some uh, countries in our region are trying to tell them that you are not enough, you do not have enough. They do have enough, they are enough, and capable of making their future. And we are pretty sure that they can. Another troubled spot is Yemen. And uh, a few days ago, both the Saudis and the Hutu movement announced a ceasefire over the period of the Ramadan. How do you see the Yemeni situation unfolding? Uh, more than seven years of uh, very very bloody war against defenseless Yemenis by Saudi Arabia and uh, some other countries in the region. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a humanitarian uh, tragedy right now happening inside Yemen because of, uh, because of this siege imposed by Saudi Arabia. They are in basic needs. They need water. They need medicine. They need very basic things and unfortunately Saudi Arabia, I don't know how they can do that. Uh, blockade, blockading all the country and trying to deprive them from even basic needs. Uh, we from the beginning said that there is no military solution to Yemeni crisis. There should be Yemeni, Yemeni talks, intra-Yemeni talks and the only way is this uh, diplomatic solution and political solution. Iran proposed four-point plan, starting with uh, cessation of hostility and uh, removing the uh, uh, removing this uh, siege and uh, of of course Yemeni Yemeni talks and uh, and 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 uh, a united government or uh, a pure Yemeni government. But unfortunately, at that time, Saudi Arabia and its uh, uh, its allies didn't accept that and they continued with this delusion that they are going to win this war in less than few weeks. Now more than seven years of non-stop war 
and 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 sometimes they have done uh, carpet bombing against defenseless uh, Yemenis. They have targeted places several times uh, because they, the, 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 there is lack of enough targets for their uh, for their attacks. So what's going on right now in Yemen? We have to stop this um, human tragedy. We have to help the Yemeni Yemeni talks uh, to be successful. We welcome uh, their decision uh, uh, to stop cessation of hostility even uh, temporarily. We hope that we can actually prolong this and to help the Yemeni ordinary people to have a better situation. What about the situation in Afghanistan since the U.S. left? U.S. left uh, uh, the, uh, the whole country in catastrophe. Uh, United States uh, uh, invaded Afghanistan with this uh, promise that they are going to topple down Taliban. Twenty years later, they negotiated with the same Taliban to leave the country and left the country with uh, and ruined everything that the the, uh, the 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 country and the people of Afghanistan were hardly could actually uh, construct in their society. What is what what is happening right now in Afghanistan is not very much promising. Uh, people are in basic needs uh, in the middle of. Uh, a very hard winter, they lacked fuel, they lacked uh, uh, food, medicine. Iran tried to help them as we neighbor Afghanistan. Iran, uh, based on the request of the people of Afghanistan, sent uh, fuel and oil to Afghanistan. We provided them humanitarian assistance. And by the way, we received more than uh, thousand, hundred thousand of new dislocated Afghani people and refugees. Iran is now hosting more than 4.5 million Afghan refugees and on a daily basis thousands of them are crossing our borders and we cannot continue this alone because international community and those who made all this catastrophe are now absent and now they are gone. They ran away from Afghanistan and left uh, uh, Afghanistan with all these uh, disastrous uh, outcome of their presence. Should we expect, is it possible for relations between Iran, Saudi Arabia and other Western controlled countries in the region to improve? Sure, if there is a sh paradigm shift in some of the capitals, respected capitals and they respond to Iran's uh, extended hands, then there would be uh, some sort of rapprochement. There are those inside our, uh, our region uh, still looking outside of our region to build something for the region. Uh, the history shows us very well that the only solution to our problem comes from internal dynamism and, and paradigm shift in those capitals trying to, uh, uh, trying to have an indigenous framework for uh, a regional arrangement would definitely help. Well, viewers, we're going to take another, another short break. And when we come back, we would conclude this interview by looking at inside Iran. What is Iran doing in order to promote what has been called the resistant economy? What are the prospects for Iran developing its capability to solve the problems that confront its people? Short break. Well, hello and welcome back to this very, very special edition of Talk Time. And it is our privilege that today we are talking to Dr. Saeed Khalid Zada, who is the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And it's also the spokesperson <coughs> of the ministry. Your Excellency, internally, there's been talk about building a resistant economy and so on. What is Iran doing in order to consolidate the gains of this revolution? Uh, this is the absolute responsibility of a government to protect and to promote 
the situation and welfare of its people. So regardless of all the difficulties and problems that Washington and some other countries has tried to impose on the Iranian people, we as the government decided to, uh, to be innovative and to be responsible for the sake of the benefits and for the sake and benefits of our, uh, of our people and our nation. So we decided to have uh, a resilient economy, resistant in terms of resistant against sanctions imposed on Iran, resilient in terms of uh, being surviving and also trying to uh, improving our economy. We have a very rich human resources inside Iran, very well educated uh, young generation, very well developed. So we decided not think, uh, we decided not being uh, passive and trying to be proactive try to uh, rebuild our economy and try to uh, communicate and trying to reach out to new markets and to new realm of activities and we successfully did that. Uh, we try to let uh, uh, knowledge based, to develop knowledge based uh, uh, enterprises inside Iran, SMEs. We try to uh, free our economy from oil, our budget from oil. Now it is less than 30% of Iran's uh, annual budget relying on oil. Uh, so all these issues helped, them, helped us to neutralize the sanctions imposed on Iran aiming to tackle down this, the political structure or making the ordinary people of Iran to revolt against the political structure. We try to bridge between the government and the people unifying the voices and unifying the people, try to uh, uh, enhance and boost uh, democratically elected institutions inside Iran, and we try to uh, to have uh, 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 to have virtual space and virtual and uh, social uh, uh, network as a base for communication among uh, among Iranians. Of course, it has been hard. It has been difficult. It has not been an easy job. We are not all. Uh, we are. We, are, we have not concluded. We are not. Uh, reaching to our aims. We are in the middle of a journey, but this journey is a journey that we think that finally we can achieve whatever has been promised uh, as the outcome of endless efforts by a country and by a nation that has survived throughout the history and throughout the millennia. Your Excellency, thank you very, very much thank for you very much. talking to us. We are most grateful for talking to us. Thank you very, very much, thank Your you very Excellency. Much. Now, viewers, we have been having a conversation with Dr. Saeed Khalib uh, Zada, who is a Deputy Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran and also the spokesperson of the ministry. And we've been talking about world affairs, we've been talking about sanctions, we've been talking about the need to build a resistance economy inside Iraq, we've looked at Afghanistan, we've looked around the world. Uh, we'd like to thank you very much for, for, for inviting us into your homes, for watching us on YouTube, for watching us on, on Facebook, and for watching us everywhere. Please keep your dial on Pan-African Television because we bring you the best in everything, best in news, best in sports, best in current affairs. See you again next week. Bye-bye.